Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today my guest is one of my colleagues from the American Bar Association Dispute Resolution Section, Chris Draper. Um, Chris has actually a wealth of knowledge for you all, to share with you all, but we're going to be honing in on data security, um, file validation technologies, and his role with one of the leading companies in that field, TROC. Um, so I'm, I first, let me just welcome you here today, uh, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. It's fun. I, I'm, ex I, you know, I, I didn't really know a lot about what you did. I, we've, we've crossed paths in the um, ABA uh, dispute resolution section. You are um, the chair of one of the co-chairs of our technology committee, um, and I know you've also been on the ODR task force as well. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So as uh, chairman of the group one for the task force, and then that's obviously with Amy Schmitz as well. And Amy Schmitz is a co-chair for the technology committee who is a uh, phenomenal, uh, currently in an academic role down in uh, Columbia, I'm uh, sorry, uh, University of Missouri in Columbia, but has a very strong background in uh, ar construction arbitration. So uh, she's an exciting one with a whole bunch of different perspectives because I'm coming from a very technology heavy perspective coming into dispute resolution. She's coming from the contract side into dispute resolution. So it's actually very fun pairing on a topic where we have a whole bunch of pieces now, as, as we've all sort of seen, everyone's struggling to figure out, I've got a ton of tech, I've got a ton of options. What does any of this mean? And what it means really depends on the perspective of how you're looking at it. Yeah, that's such a, a great way to explain it. And I think that's something that's become so obvious to so many of the practitioners. You know, most of my listeners are attorneys, mediators, arbitrators, people coming at it from the practitioner side of things. And I know that one of the reasons why so many people keep tuning into the podcast, going to the, to the um, website to look at the videos and all is because now that everyone's had that little taste of technology and how helpful it can be in our practice, the, the door is open. You and I talked about this just a second ago. The floodgates are open and everybody wants to know more. And that actually led to one of the reasons why I've been on hiatus from the podcast for the past couple of weeks is we just finished the um, ABA's dispute resolution section's very first tech expo. Chris and I served together on the planning committee, although Chris did far more than I did. Um, I was, uh, you know, he, he was really the rock star of our planning committee. Um, but the, the expo was amazing, I thought. What did you think, Chris? Yeah, no, I thought the, the, the numbers were actually really, really good. Uh, it is a technologist where you exhibit a lot of things. One of your challenges with these expos is, you know, they say, yeah, come here, pay a few thousand dollars and hang out on a website and no one shows up. Uh, and it's always been one of those things where you're like, what's this worth? Um, is really exciting to see that at our expo, we had a great series of programmings is really designed about how you need to think about tech, not just, oh, here's the next, uh, you know, here's the next thing about an academic idea of maybe this will happen someday, but it's, here's how you actually use this. In addition to that, we had an expo where vendors had a very easy way of identifying, this is what I do, right? Uh, each platform does a different thing. Uh, when you look at Zoom, for example, Zoom is a great tool for face-to-face -face communication, not so great for file sharing, not so great, you know, you wouldn't use it for file storage. Um, every, every type of tech, because there's limitations to it, is going to have bounds to where you'd want to use it. It's going to have things where it's like, this is the piece that really, really does well. And these are some things that sort of has a bolt on, but don't touch that. Um, the fact that we're able to identify technologies based on their groupings for their function was new and I think it seemed like a lot of the participants enjoyed it. Um, you know, we had something like 75% of everyone who attended went through the expo to at least one room. You had over 56% of uh, those who went into the expo signed up for a, uh, signed up for a demo with one of the technologists. I mean, these, these are, or visited their, visited their booth and 12% signed up for an actual one-on-one -on -one demo meeting. So it was, it was nice to see that we're able to actually deliver you know, value to these uh, technologists, these exhibitors in ways that we've never seen. I guess I've never been to another expo where they can tell me, here's the cost of your qualified lead. And we can say in ours, it was $9.17 is what you paid for this qualified lead. And that I think was in some ways what made that tech expo really unique and better 
Uh, and I think going forward, we have a lot of things that Amy and I are planning from the tech committee to help people understand even more about those uh, technologies and sort of expand on uh, that single event. So I'm actually really excited about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and, and I love that you know the statistics already and everything, but I want to point out to everyone, the reason why we had that sort of new perspective on creating value for our exhibitors, breaking it down by different technologies and what they do was because of Chris. Chris came into the planning committee and helped us sort of take that non-practitioner look and really the the technologists look at this type of an event and that's why it's a totally different kind of event than anything we've ever done before and another reason why i think it was so successful so thank you for that um because i i know that i was an exhibitor learn to mediate online was there and my slate of demos filled up um, I had a great deal of interest from people. I got to talk to a large number of people who were interested. And for me as a vendor, uh, that was exciting. It was exciting to talk to people who wanted to know what, you know, Learn to Mediate could, online could do for them. And I think a lot of these pieces is when, when you start to help people identify here's where the roadmap is on things, uh, people will travel it. I think the problem is when you start to throw these doors open and say, okay, we've got all this stuff and now we've got all this information, but no one helps synthesize it. it to one of your sort of light points you identified earlier is um, we have had a major sea change in how we communicate within the legal tech world, in the legal world, not even legal tech world, right? I mean, I think most people, when they say legal tech, it's sort of, a, oh, that's a nice little hashtag that I see sometimes on, you know, DocuSign, right? And yeah. so the fact that you have individuals like, you know, my father, who is a litigator, and I don't think touched a keyboard till eight years ago, um, the fact that he's now starting to look into these things is important. The problem, I think, that a lot of times we have, which is what we're trying to address with the Tech Expo, is... Um, Often the road traveled most is the loudest talker on it. Um, and so what we saw, especially as a pandemic started to hit, and we started to look at, in some ways, I think in retrospect, is going to be considered, you know, the, the early days of the video wars, right? I mean, you have um, these little tools that were being made as sort of like a side thing in big companies, right? I mean, Google wasn't taking Hangouts seriously, really, when you think about it, right? When you look right. at, um, you know, Teams, you know, I'll reserve judgment in case you get a sponsorship, but I can tell you that that wasn't <laughs> actually really seriously taken and I, it's debatable whether it still is, right? I mean, then you look at Zoom, which, you know, th it was their thing, but Zoom is always sort of seen as this thing as, oh, well, that's sort of neat. Maybe we can do something with this link somewhere, right? And then all of a sudden, as you started to see the things that Zoom had done well early on meant it became a massive leader, a massive leader overnight to a lot of individuals because of what I believe was a different approach to where they took it seriously, number one. Um, and you started to see the dollars coming out with access to misinformation, access to all kinds of, oh, we're better for this, or now this group's going to be stealing all that and whatnot. And now we end up with all these buzzwords thrown out in the security realm when no one's even sure what I'm even asking about or looking at, and then we're asking them to make decisions. And one of the biggest problems in the legal space is in many ways, you know, collegiality. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, in the legal space, when a lawyer sends me a bill, I'm supposed to just say, oh, well, they're smart. And so this bill is probably right. And so I'll pay the bill. Um, there's this understanding that, well, look, I'm, I'm brilliant and this is what my time is worth and this is what it is, so you send it back to me. We're in Des Moines and in the insurance world, the insurance company says, nope, you're going to take 20% or something, right? But in most parts of the world, this idea that there is any pushback on that collegiality is, is, is not there. The same is sometimes seen on the tech side, right? So you have some, you know, young kid with a PhD comes in, probably a hoodie, and says, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's this, this, this is the only thing you can do. And the other side's like, oh, man, well, no one questions me, so I guess I won't question them because uh, they must be brilliant, too. They got a hoodie on. And so you end up with this situation where both sides are very, very certain that they have a, you know, perspective that's right. Both sides say, well, my perspective is usually right. And when I'm the expert, I need them to believe I'm the expert. So I'm going to let them be the expert here. And what we end up with is these miscommunications where security comes this alphabet soup of just 
things that a lot of times have just been made up in the last years, their marketing piece, and they don't really say anything. And it's, it's been interesting working on the Tech Expo to help try and break us back down to two basic things with security. You know, security is fundamentally the minimization of negative consequences. That's it. I love that. That is a nice, simple, you know, that's what we're looking at with security. But there's no, yeah, security and safety, security, safety. It's, it's all about de-risking. You will never eliminate something bad. You'll never eliminate a hack if, number one, we're even using that word correctly. Uh, number two, what we forget about is who is the cause of the hack, right? So if we really break this down to first principles and say, okay, what is security? Security is looking at how I do what I'm doing and I want to remove, I want to minimize, I want to get, get as few negative consequences as possible from how I'm doing it. Um, that's the objective. If we start looking at that as the objective, it, it hopefully changes our framework. So when people come in and say, oh, I've got 56,000 K multiplexing across a you know, quadruplex or something, you're like, I don't know what any of that means. The second part of this is, if it cannot be explained in a way that makes sense towards your process, it's either wrong or keep asking. Because what we see too often is, oh, well, they said that China's stealing this, so I'm going to go off to this side and do this. Um, the, the, <laughs> the undercurrents of a lot of pieces that have been coming out with the technology and these things lately has been very interesting. I think we've got a very interesting social um, environment that allows that in some ways right now. But the fact is, technology is an incredibly multidisciplined international activity. Um, technology is not the same as when it used to be you get a CD in the mail and you put it onto a laptop and it never touches anything else. Technology is integrated in so many different pieces and technology is pulling from so many other providers, even when it's, this is my provider, this, this platform we're on right now is pulling right. from so many different pieces and there's so many different ways my data can be directed and there's so many different options I can set up. When you're setting up a Zoom meeting, I mean, the, the, you know, we've got what, 10 pages of 20 options per, um, those are all tying back to, you know, probably 30 pages of license that has a bunch of different broad statements that say, well, we could do this. And we wrap ourselves around the axle, around this idea that, you know, some kid in Siberia is trying to go around and hack into my, you know, evening drink session with my friends and take out some damning information. The problem is with that, when I start looking at minimizing negative consequence, the issue in the legal space, the, any type of space where we're collaborating has always been the human participants. It's always been, how do I organize this correctly? I mean, if I have a uh, mediation in a conference room somewhere, it's the stupid things like, oh man, I picked a conference room in a busy co-working space where the walls are really thin, right? Right, um, right, that's an in-person issue, right? It's, it's like, okay, we just printed out everyone's internal financials so we could all see them in this room and then we let everyone leave with their copy. Right, and where are they going with those? So I think that when we start looking at uh, security, the first thing we need to start doing, if we're going to be serious about security, is baselining, understanding, sort of laying out what is your process? What are you actually doing now? Pre-tech, what did you do? Um, if you go into a room of 100 mediators, you typically get about 986 different ways of mediating, right? Um, and it'll vary every three minutes. And it's like, oh, well, I do this, I do this, and I feel this, and so I text for this, and I do. It's, it's a communication problem, right? I mean, this is a communication problem. Effective mediation, effective arbitration, effective dispute resolution in general comes down, is, is, is we all know, it comes down to whether or not these two humans communicated enough data to get the information they need to reach an outcome that they both agree on. Um, right. Those are, those are the fundamentals of it. And so now technologically speaking, I need to make sure that I'm picking tools that based on how I am going to use this, make sure that the opportunity for misunderstanding is minimized, right? I need to be figuring out how do I, how do I work to make sure I'm not misunderstood as opposed to striving to be understood. Those are two very, very different things. 
I need to make sure that my technology allows to make sure that I can be not misunderstood, number one. Number two, I need to make sure once I arrive at that understanding that it's, it's archived correctly, that we actually did capture it in the way that it actually is, was meant to be. And the last piece is I need to make sure that once I do know it's there, that its permanence is appropriate. Meaning if I'm doing a restorative justice uh, issue, for example, right? Um, those are items where I need to know, number one, everyone understood what they were doing at the time. Everyone understood the issues. Everyone understood when they got to a conclusion that they agreed on that conclusion. I then need to make sure when I transfer that into written form, that the written form of it is correct. But at the end, especially restorative justice issues is, is unique in the fact that I need that to be immediately permanent. So for a certain period of time, everyone who is in it agrees to it, but then I need it to disappear in a way that it can never harm them again. And so these three phases of how do I make sure my communication is effective? How do I make sure that my archiving of what we've agreed is accurate and make sure that my uh, retention is appropriately permanent? Are your three major pieces of your process that you need to know what you do before you can ever start to look at technology because there is no chance of understanding security if we don't know what your potential negative outcomes could be. Correct. And most people are just looking for that quick fix, right? They're looking for, I'm just going to buy this product, this technology product. It's going to take mm. care of everything for me and I don't have to worry about it. Um, and it really, I think you've pointed out, right? It's, it starts with the user and their process, not with what you buy to plug in to fix, to patch things up or fix things. I mean, you, you and Simon had a great, uh, and actually uh, for people, I think had access to the expo, you can go back and watch this. Your Thursday morning session was great. And one of the big points on it, which was about how do we effectively communicate? And uh, you know, I phrase it a little differently when I think about it sometimes, which is that, uh, if you had a mediator who came into the room with you and just had an aneurysm and they have like only half their words available to them, right? And so now you have this mediation with this, this person is like half a media. You'd be pretty pissed. Like you'd be like, dude, how did you not know the word Corvette, right? Depending on your, you know, who you're with. But, you know, it's like, how do you not know that word? And you'd be really, really mad, like mad enough you'd probably like either sue him or try to disbar him or something. And yet you take that individual and say, hey, by the way, we're going to go do this over video. And guess what? You've just lost 80% of your nonverbal cues. And your entire value as a mediator may have been, oh, I was the person that comforted people. And I had this magnetic attitude. And I could really just change the feeling of the room. And now I'm using video. And I'm going to charge the same. And it turns out I'm only 20% effective because I never adjusted to the new culture of communication. That's a security risk. That is an effectiveness risk because now you're only 20% the media you were because you haven't retrained with how to use the tool. You haven't adjusted your process to make sure it's compatible with the technology you're using. And if you try to jam that technology into a use it doesn't fit in, you're going to end up with negative consequences. And so ergo to our original uh, yeah. definition, we're looking with security to minimize your negative consequences that fundamentally comes down to how the human operates this very human uh, system. Well, and that's actually a great segue too, because I, I was looking at your bio and, and the first line in Chris's bio is, Chris is an expert in reducing human mistakes when using novel tech. This is his area of expertise. And, you know, this is a good segue over to, because you're the managing director of Troct. That is your, your role. And Troct um, was a, I'll be honest, was a technology I did not know before the Tech Expo, before you and I met. Um, I find it fascinating what it can do and how it can be applied for those of us in the dispute resolution world or the legal world or, and well beyond that. But most of my listeners are in this world. Um, so let's just move on to TROCT. I mean, let, I have to tell you first, it's T-R-O-K-T. -T. Let's just talk about the name and what it means <laughs> and why that's the name because people are going to want to know. Yeah, well, you, you hit on something that has actually been true with us from the beginning is that we are terrible marketers. So uh, <laughs> the first, uh, it, it's, it's always exciting to go into a conference or in a podcast or anything else and people are like, this is the coolest thing I've never heard of. You're like, 
Yeah, that's our, that's our biggest problem. So, um, <laughs> the, however, the, the origin of the name, uh, I did my PhD in Scotland and my PhD was in, uh, again, how do we identify uh, effectiveness, risk? Uh, how do we know when a certain type of new tech is useful and something we can use? Um, and so the, with all of our uh, business ventures, there's a very Scottish uh, line in that uh, naming process. Uh, number one, because there's a lot of words that uh, have less than five letters, which is uh, an internet to do, and uh, they're not taken because uh, Scottish Gaelic is not the most popular internet language. So uh, Trot, I understand for those of you who actually do know Scottish Gaelic, I know there's no Ks in the language, but it turns out no one in America can pronounce T-R-O-C-H-D, which was our first go at it. So the first big marketing thing was put a K in there instead and make it phonetic. So Trot is Scottish Gaelic for negotiate. And um, where we started was um, we saw in the public school system in Iowa, which is only 1% of the nation's population, we were wasting $30 million per year in collective bargaining every year. Um, now, you can argue that our process, there can be improvements to it. But as we started looking at it, what we found was that uh, people were sending Word documents back and forth for long contracts amongst groups of 30 to 40 people on one side, one or two on the other side. You had these imbalances in power. You had imbalances in education and experience in that process. Uh, but the ironic thing was um, Word is a great archiving tool. If you have something that you say, I want, this is what I know, this is what my language is, and I want to get it right, and I, I'm going to put it down mostly right, and then someone might make a few mods and I can, oh, I'll change that mod, change that mod, change them out that. Great tool for that, right? We're, these word processing tools were designed around how we use a typewriter. Uh, and we use a typewriter by taking all our notes on paper, hashing it out on, you know, on paper and pencil, and then we just type up and archive it. We now use it as if it's a negotiation platform. So we say, oh, hey, yep, we got this idea. I'm going to throw my ideas out on Word. I'm going to email them to you. And then you're going to take a look at them and send them back to me. So you're actually having your whole idea creation process in an archiving tool. As a technologist, you look at it and say, that's just, that just doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? But the fact is, it's because how we've always done it, right? And it's because, you know, we, we always shipped documents through the mail. And we assumed, oh, the mail is the same. So I'm going to put a electronic document in some electronic mail. The thing we forget, though, is that mail is a trust system. Socially, we don't open other people's mail. And it's hard to open other people's. I have to physically go do it, right? right? Email was developed by a bunch of engineers in a basement. And I'm not saying that's a negative. What I'm saying is they had an inherent trust environment to that tool. That tool was only used in an environment of individuals where they had a shared trust. And so the tool is very easy to get to places that it's that's intended to go that you trust as we're using it now it's incredibly easy to go to places that it wasn't intended that you don't trust and the problem with email when you start looking and thinking back if you actually go look at your your year and ask yourself how many times did i get the wrong email from someone or how many times was the attachment not there or how many times did i read that email I'm like why did they say that they're such a jerk like why did they do this and it turns out they didn't mean to say it they just did that tool has an error rate that plays into your security that you need to account for. I one time is, is a side story. I know we have timing, so I won't get into too many rabbit holes. However, I received an email one day and I thought, this is a really big email. I wonder, I wonder why this email is so large. We were doing some work with the state of Iowa and we, um, you know, we were having shipping documents back and forth, but this one seemed really, really large. So I started opening it up. And as I start reading, I realized, oh my goodness, so these are all the internal financials of a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical. And it turns out that the only thing that they have in common that I have is that my name's Chris. Um, and so that's a massive problem. I knew the other Chris, we were on a board together, so I understand why that I got it. It's just an accident, is the way that it auto-filled in. Imagine if you're a sole practitioner, you're working on a billion dollar divorce, and you just sent all of your internals over to the other side via email wow, I don't know if you'd get a chance at another $2 divorce. Right. And that is the problem we were looking to solve was that first, instead of having this archiving tool shipping back and forth through very unsecure medium, what we built originally was a platform that mimics how we negotiate. It allows you to take one big document problem or process. It allows you to break it up into little pieces. It allows you to close down those pieces as you go. So as you say, okay, we've got 
five issues. Here's our five issues. Oh, I can agree on how we've written number four or number three. So we close them out. No one can change them. We make sure it's archived as who agreed and when. We can see all these track changes at that little piece by piece level, which is what we do normally. We just do it in a big old document that gets sent back and forth until we accidentally send the wrong document to the wrong place or send the wrong changes or sit in 50,000 shades of fuchsia that I can't read. Right. Well, that was a problem we were made solving. It, made it look like it's been bleeding. <laughs> yes. Or, and, you know, and often now, once you get into too many iterations, it's now bleeding pink and purples. And you're just like this, you know, it's, it's like walking in a Toys R Us when we still had them, right? So it's your, your brain is on overload, right? Exactly. So, well, so that's, the, you know, as a family law mediator or, or divorce attorney, that's how we've always done it. I, I, I love how you simplify that because what we would do is draft a separation agreement send it to the other side. I'd get it back from them with all their red lines and their comments and their suggested changes, which I'd go through and do my co different color and it would go back and forth. And you're right. I can't tell you how many times there would be a question at the end of which version are we using? Did someone actually sit down with this, you know, hundred page document and go through and make sure we're using the properly conformed document for signature in the end? Um, and did that correct one get done? So explain for the listeners and our, we're, we're running close to the end of time, but I want to make sure what does TROCT do? How would it help a mediator, an arbitrator, an attorney resolve this issue? Yep. So on this piece, the way to think of TROCT from that original use case is we're a legally defensible Google Docs that allows you to keep closing your document down piece by piece by piece. So everyone logs in one platform. They have the ability to operate within their own team privately and control all the privacy controls their own team privately from read, write, to who gets to see and who gets to agree and who gets to share things. And everything is built with this idea that in this case, you send your document over, there's going to be 90% of it you agree off the bat. So you can break those 90% into their own thing, close them out. No one can actually touch it. They can all see it. It's all there. What we fundamentally do is we just keep shortening the document until you finally close it out, which is exactly how we solve problems in these mediation cases, right? It's how do I take a big, big problem, break it into a lot of small ones and keep closing them down, knocking them down while I still have, we have a discussion tab allows you have free ranging discussions that aren't recorded, that can be deleted, that can be replied to and liked. And we really went and said, how does this process work? And let's actually build a piece of tech that mimics that process. Um, and so that was really the first place where we started, where we have obviously, you know, as you've noted as well, the, the world has been slow to catch up to some of these things and inertia in humans is, is, is a, a force that uh, you, you cannot ever underestimate because it will no. get you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's, yeah. It's worse than an avalanche, you know, <laughs> because you, you can't even get it down the hill. But the, the thing that we were finding with Troct and one of the challenges was that um, many people we're not going to change that fundamental process. So those who've moved over into our platform seem to love it. Um, it seems, you know, our error rates gone significantly down. We start in labor relations. And so we would get, you know, when we get done, um, you would get these, uh, the, these uh, people who are formally wrangling 30 people on email with 80,000 emails. And I say, oh my God, I can't, this is so much better. And their outcomes were better, which was great because they knew what they were arguing. Right. That part was, you know, getting your entire team around knowing what my position is that's often the most difficult part with these distributed multi-person, you know, mediations facilitation. So, however, we saw that that wasn't always for everyone. One of the things that we were seeing though was in the tech space, um, we're losing access to truth. Um, and this is the biggest piece that we're uh, focused on right now is, and what I mean by that is, if you have a document that starts digital, and you make it for your, you know, you, you make it for your parties and you, you say you're an arbitrator or something, you write up your document, you send it to your parties, your parties have it, uh, everything's good. So as an arbitrator, you delete all your stuff. Um, and so you don't have it anymore. And then five years later, they go to court. Uh, they go to court and one side says, here's my document. And the other side says, oh no, here's my document. This is the one I got from you. I said, oh, this is the one I got from them. And they're completely opposite. They just happen to delete the most important paragraph. Right now, Proving that in the courts is nearly impossible. Um, the way we prove those things is we look at the document, just like you'd look at a package that you get shipped from the mail. You know, we see it left this, we left the factory, it arrived at this place, and then got sent to this holding station, it got sent to this holding station, now it got sent to you. And I have that chain of custody recorded. And if I can see that, I know, oh, so this is the package that came from here. 
In documents and digital files, we do the same thing. We call it metadata. So that metadata is able to tell me, okay, it went from Billy to Jimmy to stored here and went here and here it is. And one of the things that got out there early and a lot of law firms or practitioners are doing is like, ooh, metadata, this is scary stuff. I got to clear this out or I got to be careful of it. I got to get rid of it. And when you get rid of it, that's fine. Gone. <laughs> and then when you get to court and they say, well, what is it? And say, okay, well, let's check the metadata. And so we'll, you know, we'll do a forensic analysis. You know, oh, that sounds all right. And how, how much does that cost? Oh, 20 grand. Okay, that's fine. And so the forensic analysis comes in, you've just blown 20 grand. And their answer is, well, we can't tell you that anything doesn't look wrong. Um, that's a real problem. So when you actually start to either lose little blips of control or you've wiped your whole control, proving truth when you get to court becomes impossible. Or more importantly, if I have a lot of documents that need to, need to go and say, okay, these, I can't spend 20 grand every one. How do I quickly know what is right or wrong immediately? Those are the types of things we need to do. And so that's what TROC, we built, uh, we built a little tool. It can sit on someone's uh, laptop, so it can get integrated into small firms. And what it does is it basically takes a thumbprint of every file that's sensitive. So if you go and you create my final document, you've signed it all off. We have this final signature thing before you send it to the parties, you take its thumbprint and that little thumbprint gets stored in our network. And so in the future, any court in the developed world, you take that to, if you thumbprint it again, our, do, our, our uh, network can tell you this file has not had one, 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 zero, one period when anything changed since this date when I originally saw it. So what we've been doing is on the first hand, the original truck platform was how do I make sure people can communicate effectively without 50,000 shades of fuchsia? How can we make sure from template to signature, this is the agreement that we had. And the big thing that we're doing now, whether or not you use our system or not, um, you can actually go on a truck.com right now and download our thumb printer and we'll do, uh, we'll basically do a hundred free documents you can use through our thumb printer. Uh, if, if you've listened to this podcast oh, thank um, you. and you can, Oh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to discuss these things because I think that a lot of times we look at digital and say, I just need the closest thing to paper. I love my paper. I love my pen on paper. I love sitting down face to face. This gets me close enough because I'm looking at each other on video. I got this Word document that works and then, oh, I need a signature. So I'll put a DocuSign thing on it and then um, I'm just going to put it in a filing cabinet. And Dropbox looks like a filing cabinet, so this should be good. When we're thinking about security, the fact is when we break that back out, the way we're now communicating with these tools like Word is not the way we were doing it around the room. It wasn't right. pencil and human. It's now archived, archived, archived. We're now sending it through a vehicle that isn't the mail. This is an email. It's a great system, but you have to know that you've implemented a way to make sure you trust who's on your side. You need to make sure you're using the, hey, by the way, are you sure you meant to send to this person? Which is what we implement. We need to then start to look at this thing and say, okay, my signatures, did I even get the right document into DocuSign or did I just PDF up incorrectly with all of my internal notes on the PDF, by the way, because I didn't know how to do that part. I did, I just PDF all my internal notes into my Word document, went and got signed. And then, oh, I put it in Dropbox. But by the way, my Dropbox I have, I, to make it easier on my clients, I share my folder with my clients. And now it turns out that all my other clients in this other case now have this one too. It's not to say that there aren't risks and that isn't to say there aren't places where things can go wrong when you move into technology, but security comes down to, did you understand the human element? Did you look at the human problems you're looking to solve from how do I communicate to how do I document to how do I appropriately protect? And did I pick the right tech that fits together to get us that human solution that's tech enabled not a technology solution I need to fit everyone into. Um. Well, and I think that's the, the bottom line key to all of this. I know everyone out there, you're, ta you're talking about these things that can happen. And I'm thinking of instances in my career where this technology would have been so helpful to have as recently as I had a prenup where it's 10 years beyond the prenup and each party had a different version of it. And it was a very critical component that they had different versions. Thankfully, 
I still had the original file, paper file, because this was from 10 years ago, and we were able to resolve it. But if it had been a more recent issue, this could have very well been something. So Chris, I, I want to make sure, how can people reach out to you for more information and find Troct um, to get more information on, on the program? Yeah, please. If you just visit troc.com, uh, the big thing that we're doing right now is our thumbprinter technology, which is avoiding this problem of, of future val validation. And if you want to reach me directly, my email is very simple at chris at troc.com, just the C-H spelling. Uh, so C-H-R-A-S at troc.com, T-R-O-K-T. So for troc.com, T-R-O-K-T.com. Yeah, exactly. And I'll have that in the show notes. Also, how can people take advantage of your very generous um, offer to let them have 100 free rights on Troc? Yeah, please. When you, uh, when you fill out the form of, hey, I want to learn more information. So you can download our thumb printer directly from the site. But in order to use it, uh, you would need to, a beta version of our thumb printer. So it won't be as easy to use. You might have to reach out to us to, to let you uh, make sure you're understanding where things are at sometimes in these versions and you put LTMO into the how did you hear about us and then we'll get you an authorization code that has the 100 free rights on it. So. That's amazing. I very much appreciate that on behalf of my, uh, my listeners and I'll be taking advantage of that myself. So thank you very much, Chris. And I, I really appreciate your taking the time to come here and, and help, um, you know, broaden the knowledge base of my listeners. The one thing that's been a positive, I think, out of COVID and as we've all pivoted online is most practitioners seem very open-minded and actually eager for more information on technology and how it can help us. Um, the Tech Expo, which you were so integral in, was such a great step toward that. But this, uh, this podcast episode is going to help people too. So thank you so much. No, thank you very much for the time.